Uh, Domenico Giuliano will speak about the violation of the Wiedemann Front's law in the topological condo model. Please. Thank you, Andrea. <clears throat> so I would like to start the presentation by uh, thanking Andrea and all the other organizers for, first of all, giving me this opportunity, but also for putting all their efforts in organizing um, a conference. Does it work? Right. A conference in uh, such tough times. So compliments. All right. So today I'll be talking about uh, a project I've been uh, recently working on in collaboration with uh, Andrea Nava, who is a, a PhD student of mine, um, sorry, a postdoc of mine, uh, Francesco Buccheri and Reinhold Egger from uh, Dusseldorf, and Pasquale Sodano from INFN unit uh, in Perugia. Uh, the project is about the violation of the demand France law and multi-particle scattering in the topological condom model. And our main goal is to trace out a possibly direct connection between a universal and predictable way uh, in which the demand France law can be violated the system hosting the topological condo effect. The relation is we propose is between the emergence of local Majorana modes in the system I'm going to tell you about and the violation of the Biedemann France law. So uh, to show you this, my talk will be organized uh, as described here. So I'll first uh, say a few words about heat transport uh, and the Wiedemann France law in general. Then I'll move to the uh, specific case of charge and heat transport at a junction of <clears throat> non interacting quantum wires. Then I'll promote the junction to be interacting. Uh, in particular, uh, I discuss two different uh, uh, types of interaction. So, in the bulk of the leads and at the junction. And then I'll focus on to the specific case of the topological condo effect uh, and the corresponding relation with the emerging Majorana fermions at the junction. Eventually I'll get to the main topic. So uh, onset of the topological condo effect and violation of the Wiedemann Franz law. Then I'll conclude my talk and I'll spend a few words about possible further perspectives of our project. So um, the possible, the possibly the best way for introdu of introducing in this context the uh, wiedemann franz law is by considering a, just a single wire, no interacting quantum wires behaving as a one dimensional Fermi liquid connected to uh, two external reservoirs. The two reservoirs, which from now on I'll be calling L for left and R for right are biased uh, with respect to each other by a voltage bias delta B and by a temperature bias delta T. Under this condition, we expect an electric current and the heat current respectively IE and IH to flow through the wire. And uh, in the linear uh, response approximation, IE and IH are of course both linear functions of delta V and delta T with all bunch of Onsager coefficients referred to as electric conductance, thermal power or Seebeck coefficient, Peltier coefficient and thermal conductance. Now, in specific sort of systems I'll be discussing here, I'll be always focusing on two uh, systems uh, enjoying particle all symmetry. Uh, and since this, we assume this, I'll be assuming this, and I will also work within linear response regime. Uh, from now on, I'll be not considering S and pi, which uh, to this order of approximation can be both set to zero. Uh, and also I'll be indifferently speaking about the uh, uh, heat uh, or the uh, energy current, which uh, are equal to each other up to higher order contributions in the applied biases. Now, under this condition, uh, in a uh, typically in a system behaving as a Fermi liquid, it is known that in the low T regime, so when KBT is much lower than the chemical potential, uh, the ratio between the thermal conductance and the, uh, the 
uh, charge conductance times the temperature T is a universal number usually called Lorentz number. Now, the meaning of this is basically that whatever, I mean, in the system where this wiedemann franz law holds, whatever carries charge carries heat as well. So <clears throat> this locks the ratio between the uh, corresponding conductances to be a universal uh, times T, of course, to be a universal number such as this quantity. Uh, that being said, let me now consider the uh, specific way in which wiedemann franz law is either realized or breaks down uh, at the junction of, for the time being, non-interacting quantum wires. Uh, so let me consider, say, n uh, one-dimensional um, uh, systems behaving just as Fermi liquids, which for the sake of simplicity, I'll be picturing as non-interacting fermionic systems. And also uh, I'll be not considering spin at this stage. Of course, spin can be uh, accounted for within our framework, but just as a higher order complication of uh, the basic derivation. Uh, so non-interacting means absence of interaction in the, in the wires, which sometimes I'll be also calling the leads of the junction, but it also means that whatever happens here, so right at the junction, can be fully expressed as one incoming thing coming out as one outgoing thing. Now, in let's assume that incoming thing is a particle. Uh, so uh, if, pardon, I miss to say that uh, as non-interacting one-dimensional spinless fermionic systems, we describe the lead by retaining only low energy, long wavelength excitations around the Fermi points. So it comes out that the lead Hamiltonian is the sum of N as many uh, uh, Hamiltonians, as many uh, leads uh, uh, Hamiltonians for, for uh, uh, spinless one-dimensional fermionic systems. So I call left-handed modes, the one uh, entering the junction from the corresponding reservoir, which is connected to the lead and right-handed modes will be the ones uh, coming outside of the junction toward the reservoirs. So let us suppose we shoot uh, one left-handed uh, particle against the junction from reservoir one. Uh, this can come out as a particle getting back scattered into the same wire that's called normal refraction process, or it can be normal transmitted as a particle to a different wire. But uh, since we eventually al allow for uh, the junction being connected to underneath superconductors, there is also the possibility of having anomalous Andreev processes in which the incoming particle can be either backscattered as a whole within the same lead, so that's Andreev refraction, or uh, it can undergo a cross Andreev refraction being transmitted as a whole to a lead different from the one it is uh, coming from. All this can be expressed oops, uh, in terms of a singleless matrix at the price of doubling the uh, number, the number of degrees of freedom one would get if only normal scattering processes were present. So uh, we got in the so-called number representation a 2n times 2ns matrix, whose matrix elements are related to the corresponding amplitudes for normal backscattering, normal transmission, Andrev reflection. Sorry, this should be J. Uh, uh, across under reflection by these equations. So uh, non-interacting in our specific context means non-interacting lead and whatever happens at the junction that can be described in terms of a one thing going into one thing as matrix. Right, now uh, retaining all the uh, chiral low energy modes around the Fermi uh, uh, points, the uh, charge and the heat current operators in lead J can be really written down uh, as bilinears of the chiral fields 
and eventually of their derivatives as well. Uh, we can then compute the average values of these operators in the connected system. So by considering the junction connected to the external reservoirs. And if uh, we assume that all the temperatures are biased with respect to a common reference temperature T, it comes out that within linear uh, response theory, IL and ITH, so the electric and the, uh, the charge and the uh, heat current in lead J are linear functions of the biases and the linear functions fully depend on the uh, tensor G, so the charge conductance tensor, and on the tensor K, so the heat conductance tensor. The relation between the G's, the G matrix elements and the K matrix elements and the uh, squared uh, modules of the uh, various amplitudes are given by these formulas. Now that is interesting because in this specific context, unitarity of the, S, of the extended S matrix forces a Kirchhoff law for the heat conductance. The same in general does not happen for the charge conductance because uh, the Andreev processes usually do conserve charge only modulo to E. As a result, right, this leads to a violation of the charge, uh, I mean, the charge conservation the violation of the charge conservation at the junction leads to a disentanglement between the charge and heat carriers. So what I told you at the start of the talk, I mean, whatever carries charge carries heat as well, uh, is in general not true if, Andre if either Andre reflection or Andre transmission or both processes are present. And accordingly, the wiedemann franz law is violated meaning that if I take the ratio between the matrix element KJJ prime and T times GJJ prime, this is no longer equal to L0, but it's a sort of non-universal factor, which can take in principle any value, depending on the microscopic details of uh, the junction times L0. Of course, if we do require that charge conservation holds, these guys are killed and the A's are actually so this should be the C anyway. This, the anomalous part is killed and we get back the wiedemann franz law. That's in the no interacting case. So I want to ask a question, please. Time you have, uh, and Right. I mean, if we include what happens in the uh, superconducting, uh, superconductor. So include, connecting... Exactly. So. Right. I think in principle one one could. However, we are just focusing on the, the normal leads. So we assume that we are connecting reservoirs to the leads, and that's the measurement we want to make. There is a way to uh, restore it by uh, getting stuck at the formalism we are using, uh, which is of course by uh, having a, a large uh, charging energy in the superconducting island, which is next, of course, which is next topic. Thanks for your question, by the way. Right, so uh, um, yeah, as it also came out from Michele's question, uh, in this specific case, we either have charge conservation or we expect that the wiedemann franz law is violated. Right. That's a summary of uh, what came out from, the, uh, from this first part of the talk. But now let us look at what happens in case in which we allow for uh, some interaction to uh, be present at the junction. As I told you, there's two ways in which the junction can be interacting. One is simply because there is a non-zero non electronic interaction in the leads. These are one dimensional systems. So if we turn on the interaction, typically we have to give up with the Fermi liquid description and we have to switch to the Lattinger liquid description in which uh, the low energy modes of the leads 
are basically collective plasmon excitations encoded in a plasmon field phi whose chiral components, I mean, right-handed and left-handed, here I uh, baptize phi rj in lead j and phi lj. In terms of these fields, we get the lead Hamiltonian that uh, now takes this expression. Uh, the uh, charge uh, uh, current density operator in lead j, the heat current density operator in lead j, and the uh, fermionic field operators, which are relevant when studying now the boundary dynamics I have been I haven't been talking about so far, which are as I guess you are pretty aware of, nonlinear functionals of the bosonic fields, but in addition, in order to recover the appropriate anti-commutation relations. If we want to realize the fermionic operators in bosonic language, we have also to add this gamma j, which are real fermion uh, uh, modes, typically called Klein factors, and have to be there in order to get the correct anti-commutation anti relations between the, pi, the psi fields. So far, we can just forget about them. They will come back to play in a few slides. Now, Let's start by focusing on to the, uh, uh, the effects of the bulk interaction. To do so, it's enough to uh, just focus on to a single ballistic wire. So nothing weird happening in between the two reservoirs, but now, except that now the wire is interacting. Uh, in this case, the uh, picture one can use to really compute the currents uh, when the wire is connected to the reservoirs comes from the original work by Ken and Fisher back to 1996. Basically, we can think of the L reservoir as something shooting into the wire, uh, uh, modes of the R field, bias that voltage VR and temperature TR. The same uh, we can think of when considering the R junction, except that now the modes are left-handed and the, the biases are VL and TL. So we basically have like an uh, assembly of two independent chiral bosonic theories in one plus one dimensions. The calculation of the partition function for the, uh, the biased system is straightforward. It, the Z is simply the, uh, the product of the partition function for the right modes times the partition function for the left modes. We can uh, uh, put into this calculation, both the different temperatures. So you see that the betas, so uh, uh, the, the one over KBT are different here and the biases. At the end of the day, we uh, just take advantage of the homogeneity, the homogeneity of the system. And we take the logarithmic derivatives of the partition function to get the currents. I mean, actually the average values of these operators, which of course uh, really give us back the currents. And that's the result. Now you see that if we take the uh, 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 Lorentz ratio, it's no longer equal to L0. There is a renormalization, which depends on the Lattinger parameter G. G is a non-universal parameter. It depends on interaction. It is one when the system is non-interacting. It's less than one or greater than one according to whether interaction is repulsive or attractive. So this is the first renormalization effect of the Lorentz ratio. In a sense, it's a sort of trivial effect because uh, we have actually to consider what happens not in the uh, disconnected Lattinger liquid, but in the case in which it is connected to external bulk reservoirs. Typically, the bulk reservoirs act as uh, 3D Fermi liquids. And in such a sort of system, so in the connected case, typically the effects of having a G different from one are washed out. Uh, if one goes to the continue, I mean, to the DC limit, which is the one we are considering here. Uh, it's a long story. It's known, uh, it goes back to some beautiful papers by Safi and Schulz and by Maslow and Stone that rigorously prove this. Now oh, that is important, however, because uh, we eventually want to disentangle this, this effect 
from the one I'm going to discuss right now. So far, we've been focusing on the leads. Let's now consider the junction. Uh, we gave up with fermions, so we are considering bosons here. In bosonic language, describing the junction dynamics is typically a big mess because the uh, boundary interactions describing the junction come out to be, as you can imagine from this equation, can uh, come out to uh, come out to be highly nonlinear functionals of the bosonic fields. So everything is pretty complicated, except in some very special cases where, while in general the boundary interaction has uh, a scaling dimension that is different from one, so it flows with the reference scale, which can be the bias or the temperature or something else with dimension of energy. Uh, there's special points, which are the renormalization group fixed points, where uh, this does not happen. And pretty often, the uh, junction dynamics can be fully encoded in terms of simple linear relations between the right-handed and left-handed modes. There's a row matrix whose entries are just pure numbers, so no dependence on, the, on any dimension full scale in a row. It's called the splitting matrix. And these are really uh, sweet equations because by employing them, we can uh, go through the so-called unfolding trick. So we can define rather than two n different fields with opposite chirality, just n left-handed chiral fields. In terms of these fields, we can write down both the electric, the charge and the heat current. And now the calculation is, as you can imagine, write a straightforward generalization of the Kane Fisher one. So, let me just point to the result, which is this equation for the charge conductance tensor and this one for the heat conductance tensor. Let us now take the Lorentz ratio, which of course depends in general depends on J and J prime. You see that compared to what we would get in the uh, non-interacting case, here we have two renormalization effects. One is our old friend, one over G, but we sort of suspect that this is washed out uh, if we do the measurement in the connected junction. The other one is this green, sta green stuff, which is fully dependent on the row matrix. The row matrix encodes just things that happen at the junction. So this is fully dependent on the junction dynamics. That is important because from now on, we'll be mostly focusing on this effect, which is independent of whether we are connecting or not the junction to Fermi liquid reservoirs. Right, that's the technical way uh, for mathematically uh, disentangling the red from the green effect. Uh, it's just some simple algebra. Uh, it's a straight generalization of the Safi and Schultz method. Uh, what happens is that if rho is the splitting matrix in the disconnected junction, so when one takes into account the Lattinger uh, parameter normalization as well, and hat row is a splitting matrix in the connected system. These are the relations giving us rho as a function of hat row or vice versa if one inverts all these relations, right? So this trick mathematically allows us for ripping out the effects depending on the bulk interaction in the leads. And so for uh, this allows us to identify genuine multiparticle scattering processes. I mean, the effects of genuine multiparticle scattering processes at the junction. So that's the preliminary stuff, a bit too long, but now I can go straight to uh, a few examples, which point eventually to uh, our final result. Uh, let's now consider the first non-trivial junctions uh, done with spinless Lattinger liquids, except uh, to lead one, that is the junction made out of three interacting quantum wires. 
That's a problem originally studied by Shamon Oshikawa and Ian Affleck in a couple of papers uh, quite a few years ago. And the system is basically three wires connected to each other at a junction. Eventually, one uh, can also assume that there's some magnetic flux piercing the junction, which is some phase chi that is an additional parameter uh, of the system. The three wires are connected to three reservoirs, just as the, uh, what happens in the uh, cartoons I showed you already. And uh, all the boundary dynamics <clears throat> is encoded by the uh, boundary Hamiltonian HB taking this form. Phi J is the Latinger liquid uh, field in lead J. Now that is interesting because you see that the boundary interaction Hamiltonian only depends on the relative fields Phi J minus Phi J plus one, which is an effect of having a charge conservation at the junction. So we've got charge conservation, but the junction is interacting. So something interesting can happen in this case. Let me briefly review the phase diagram of this system. Uh, it strongly depends on the uh, on what is the value of the Lattinger parameter G. When G is less than one, there's only one stable fixed point of the phase diagram. That is the disconnected fixed point, physically describing the case in which the three wires are disconnected from each other. That's a pretty boring case. Uh, in this case, both rho and hat rho are equal to the identity matrix and both the conductance tensors are equal to zero. Yes, please. Pardon? Yes, of course. You are in. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, this excludes the possibility of having the end. Uh, good question. The answer is no, does not exclude, of course, but uh, I'm going to tell you actually. Okay, thank you. So thanks to Michele's question, I have to, I knew help my job in the, in the talk. Great. So, so, all right. Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. Uh, so, so, right, pretty boring fixed point. Uh, some additional uh, interesting stable fixed point in the phase diagram arise when G lies between one and three. Note that G less than one covers all the range of repulsive bulk interactions. Now we've got uh, attractive bulk interactions. This already means that there must be some attraction in the, in the leads. In this case, uh, there's three different uh, stable fi uh, fixed points in the phase diagram. The chiral chi plus or minus fixed points, which are fixed points that uh, maximize the uh, time reversal symmetry breaking due to uh, a possibly non-zero phase chi. These fixed points are described according to uh, uh, Shamon Oshikawa Afflex work to a splitting matrix that takes this form when in the disconnected case. And in the connected case is simply this one, but with G set to one. Uh, that is interesting because the special splitting matrix one obtains in this case it's no violation of the Wiedemann France law. And indeed, this is, oh, sorry, this is related to the fact that the chiral fixed points in the non interacting limits can be realized by fine tuning the boundary interaction parameters, even for G equals to one. Uh, right. And accordingly, we get no Lorentz ratio normalization when G is one. So in the connected case, we expect the chiral fixed points uh, not to give anything interesting from our point of view. There's also an additional very uh, uh, pretty fixed point, which is this M for mysterious fixed point. Uh, still there's uh, the, the actual theory for this fixed point is not known. However, some uh, numerical studies by Ramani, Shimon, Affleck, and other people, uh, which uh, appeared in a 2012 FISREFB paper, show that in the connected case, I mean, 
actually they proved the evidence, these are the MRG calculations, proved the evidence, provided the evidence that in the connected case, uh, the M fixed point can be fully described in terms of a single particle, single fermion S matrix, uh, with in addition, uh, charge conservation still holding. So from our point of view, at least in the connected case, the M fixed point is not interesting either. Now, let's now consider these red fixed points, which become stable at a pretty large and in a sense some physical value of the interaction. I mean, G greater than three is a lot of stuff, is a huge interaction and likely something happens in the bulk, some phase transition. Uh, so we can hardly expect that at such large values of interaction, the leads still behave as Lattinger liquids. Anyway, uh, these red fixed points, so DP, DN fixed points, correspond to the fact that, uh, I mean, they basically correspond to huge values, ideally uh, uh, infinitely large values of the coupling strength in front of HP. So in order to get a, a description of these fixed points, one has to attempt to minimize the boundary interaction. This basically means pinning the relative fields which in a sense makes the calculation sort of easy because one has to just impose uh, uh, open boundary conditions in the, uh, where is it? Sorry. Okay, in center of mass field, which I'm not showing here. Anyway, and to pin the relative fields, uh, but okay, sorry, uh, I'm showing you in a couple of slides the, the details on this. But the interesting part of the story is what is what, what the raw matrix looks like at these fixed points. You see that now is two over three minus the identity. If we now compute both G and K using this raw matrix, we see that we get a combined violation of a Biedemann Franz law again. But interestingly enough, even if we get rid of this G uh, one over G uh, renormalization that is due to the bulk, we still have a non-trivial universal and predictable um, number in front of a zero, which is this two over three. So it's simple, pretty and predictable number. In addition, we, you see that both G and K have the same tensor dependence on the uh, indices. So in the ratio, whatever, uh, I mean, the tensorial part just simplifies. So it's just universal number independent of uh, both J and J prime. Now that is interesting because as Michele uh, predicted, uh, this is indeed due to anomalous processes that show up at the junction. Uh, they are due to uh, the non-trivial nature of the scattering processes at the junction they are, I mean, this number is telling us that whatever happens at the junction is no longer one thing going into one thing only. So you're right, Michele, Andre processes, but charge conservation still holding. So you have to have multi-particle scattering processes, right? That's good news because there's something interesting and we have a way to predict it uh, by looking at the violation of the wiedemann franz law. Bad news is that to get uh, uh, this universal physics stable, we have to have an unphysically large value of G first. And second, even though we were able to get G greater than three, still we have to uh, remind ourselves that we are doing the measurement in the connected system, right? So this get back, uh, this not only normalizes G back to the value G equals to one, but this also uh, makes the physics switch back to the non-interacting case for what concerns the phase diagram. So in fact, what happens is that the fixed point realized in the connected junction is no longer DP, but is a sort of like non-interacting fixed point, which is even also non-universal. So uh, this 
in a sense, discouraging us. We would like to get the same physics, but for g equals to one. So how to make it? That's our proposal. Uh, how much time do I see left, Andrea? All right, uh, I'll be super fast. Okay, say something in between five and 10. Say anything in between five and 10. I try to get close to the lower bound. Thank you. So uh, that's our proposal. Our proposal is to look at the specific realization of the condo effect. Now, uh, there's a lot of condo work, even in this specific uh, context. Uh, that's interesting because shows that this, this is relevant. But there's also a bit discouraging because in uh, a huge number of the cases people have been working on, uh, there's no violation of, of the wiedemann franz law at the condo fixed point. Now, this is, this is in a sense predictable if one considers the standard condo effect because, uh, I mean, the standard uh, screen, perfectly screened or underscreened condo effect because in that case, the fixed point is described by no Fermi Fermi-liquid theory. So it's a Fermi-liquid end of the story. Amazingly, the wiedemann franz law still holds in the case of the overscreened multi-channel con effect, where it is well known, starting from the original works by uh, uh, Ludwig and Affleck, that the fixed point is a non-Fermi-liquid. Uh, the reason being again that even though that's not a Fermi liquid, in that even also in that case, whatever carries charge carries heat as well. So that's the reason why Ivan Franz Lucy holds. In our specific case, we consider a topological condo system. Now, uh, since I'm running out of time. I don't, um, don't go through the details of the physical realization of the system. You are welcome to ask me questions, of course, about that. Uh, that has been, the effect has been predicted, however, at the uh, uh, junction formed by three wires uh, um, uh, connected to a uh, superconducting island with a finite charging energy. Um, the wires are spinless and Majorana modes are predicted to emerge at any interface between the normal part of the wire and the part deposited on the superconducting island that gets superconductivity by proximity. Uh, skipping the technical details, let me get just to the uh, effective Hamiltonian describing this system. That's a condo-like Hamiltonian where the effective impurity spin is realized as bilinears of the fermion uh, of the Majorana modes. And the, the uh, uh, lead spin density is realized as a non-local functional of the lead fields. Now, uh, getting back to the bosonization framework, which allows us to treat the uh, case in which the, 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 the leads are both interacting or non-interacting, uh, we get this boundary Hamiltonian describing the junction. You see that we have to introduce the Klein factors as well, which means that uh, we can pair together the Majorana and the Klein uh, real fermions. Uh, you see that all these guys basically commute with anything else in the world or the junction. So we can just get rid of them and treat them for pure numbers, say one, for instance, which is one of the allowed the eigenvalues. Uh, we can just erase all these fermions part from the Hamiltonian with the result that now the junction, though it looks like the uh, Shamon Affleck Oshikawa, uh, Shamon Oshikawa Affleck one, now it is bosonic. So there's no effects related to the Klein factors. This strongly affects the phase diagram. It can be shown that the phase diagram of the junction now is like this. We have uh, two, just two fixed points. One is our real friend, the DFP, Another one I call here generically strongly coupled fixed point, which is basically uh, a strict relative of the DP fixed point in the uh, Affleck, uh, uh, in the uh, Shamono Shikawa Affleck junction, except that now 
I mean, the green, the green uh, line correspond to uh, a finite coupling fixed point whose position is determined by G. It is repulsive and corresponds to a quantum phase transition between the disconnected and the strongly coupled phase. Now, that's uh, interesting because uh, um, it comes out that both fixed points are stable for G lying between three over four and one. This guy, the strongly coupled fixed point, becomes stable for G higher or equal than one. So outcome, we again have these interesting physics. So the row matrix that takes this form eventually leading to a non-trivial universal unpredictable violation of the Wiedemann trans law. But now in the even in the non-interacting limit. So we do expect that this effect persists even in the case in which the junction is connected to external Fermi liquid reservoirs, which is possibly the uh, relevant case for even for like experimental measurements. Why is it so? And I'm going to finish because what basically forbid us from getting this in the uh, Shamono Shikawa effect junction was this uh, Klein factor term. It can be shown that due to the presence of the Klein factor, uh, one gets boundary operators destabilizing these D like fixed points as long as G is less or equal to three. But these bad guys, so the Klein factors, are now got rid of thanks to the hybridization that's actually baptized Majorana Klein hybridization. Very interesting, uh, two big names put together uh, with the Majorana modes. So in our view, the possibility of recovering in a universal, predictable, stable fashion, this effect, uh, I'm sorry, the Wiedemann, the violation of the Wiedemann France law, sorry, where is it? Right. This effect is directly related to the emergence of the Majorana modes at the junction. And it is a possible way of uh, uh, setting up a novel, maybe effective uh, experimental probe of the so far pretty elusive Majorana formats. Right, just to conclude, I'd like to give you a physical picture of what, what is happening at the strongly coupled fixed point. And I think I should uh, like all this to Michele, because indeed, uh, from the physical point of view, the strongly coupled fixed point, uh, even in the non-interacting case and in the charge conserving case, a host violation of the wiedemann franz law, because the leading uh, uh, low energy processes, scattering processes at the junction, now are like processes like this. You see that they are, multi-particle scattering processes. The most elementary processes are something uh, such as shooting three particles against the junction from lead one, getting two emerging particles into lead two and three, and one backscattered hole into lead one. You see that we got a anomalous and wave light reflection, but the total charge is conserved. There is an alternative process here, of course, all of them contribute the final result. And here the difference is that we got uh, uh, some cost and wave reflection process, but still the total charge is conserved. So the three particles come outside, the hole is shot into the, the junction, the arrow points this way just because this is a hole. So, I guess this is more or less it. This is our main conclusion. Uh, it is important that even though we get we have G equals to one, uh, the condo physics makes the uh, strongly coupled fixed point attractive and the physics universal. So that number is universal. It is possibly not spoiled by, uh, I mean, it can be spoiled by leading irrelevant operators but still that is an effect that should scale down to zero uh, if we go to the low temperature, low energy, low bias voltage. And these are the main conclusions I already told you about. 
just one extra word about what we are doing now. One possible idea is to extend our analysis to junctions of spin chains. That's different because there's no actual Majorana modes there, but uh, it has been shown in a number of papers by Nicolas Crampé and Andrea Trombettoni, by Alexei Etzvelik, by um, Pasquale Sodano, Arturo Tagliacosta, Andrea Trombettoni, and myself, that to make an appropriate low energy long wavelength description of a junction of spin chains, one has to put into play uh, Klein factors, which in a sense behave just as Majorana fermions. So we might find evidence for the uh, emergence of these real fermions. They are not Majorana, but look like they were so. Thank you for your attention. Um, questions? Okay. Could you go back to these dominant uh, tunnel in terms? Of, yes, these ones. How do you see them from your description in terms of the five fields and the row matrix? So how do you derive, how do you see that these are the dominant terms? Right. Uh, well, you have to uh, make one charge state, one incoming charge state and see what comes out as outgoing states. You can get this from the, the row matrix, but you might want to ask uh, for, to look for a, a, an integral charge incoming state. So uh, that's actually one possible picture in which you say I'm shooting some integer charge and I get from the bosonic dynamics by just computing the outgoing states from the S matrix, what comes out. There's also an alternative description, in which you may rather think of a sort of a fractionalization of the charge. Uh, actually, uh, this is not us, honestly. This comes from a uh, 1999, uh, it's too bad I missed, just missed by, by mistake to quote the paper. Paper by Sita Nayak, Matthew Fisher, I guess Charlie Kane was on that paper as well. Uh, they uh, discuss about a number of systems analogous to this one and also about the actual system, system actually described by, uh, right, this Hamiltonian once you kill uh, all the, the fermionic bilinears. And they uh, come out with the conclusion that uh, you may think of the physics that's happening there. Uh, if you just want to have only integer charge states, then that's the actual scattering physics and okay. the minimal scattering so physics. So to summarize, you have the row that has this two third uh, and therefore uh, you are telling me that if I want to have integer charges in all the leads, I need to send uh, three of them and two of them we count. Exactly, exactly. Ah, With the okay. row matrix, you can uh, uh, compute the outgoing charge given the charge of the incoming state. So you might, you might either like don't bother uh, of having fractional charges then you say, okay, I shoot in one electron, I get two thirds of an electron uh, transmitted into both leads, I mean, two and three leads, and one third of a whole backscattering. That's Thanks. a nice picture. One is a bit boring, but perhaps more understandable is this one. Right. Uh, uh, honestly, that, 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 that's that's an excellent question. Uh, uh, I have to uh, think about it right now. I think one answer is goes through a possible answer to your excellent question goes through. Let's see. This formula. So uh, uh, the uh, the mean. Uh, I mean the 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 path that takes us that, that, that takes us from the um, Majorana fermions to the violation of the Biedermann-Franz law 
goes to the Majorana kind of realization. So I guess your question can be rephrased uh, something like, is it possible that a bound, under a bound state can undergo some hybridization mechanism with the Klein factor? Uh, I'm not sure about the answer. Uh, naively, I'd say, uh, well, I'm not aware of uh, anything like, like Majorana Klein hybridization done with uh, under bound states, but honestly, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, if you have the answer, I have so to... my is that if you consider our guidance, then uh, uh, to mimic this kind of physics, you would need uh, an Andre bound state that is uh, highly delocalized, uh, so that interpolates from one lead to the next. Whereas with Majorana's uh, two Majorana's that are localized may do the job. And uh, therefore, it's unlikely because uh, if you have such a delocalized and derived state, uh, also the density of the state decreases. And uh, so I would say that Fondo is quite robust against uh, uh, this interpretation. Right. Of the, uh, uh, Majorana. Right. Thanks. So localization is important. Okay, if there are no more questions, we thank the speaker again and we conclude the session of today.